Good afternoon, everybody, dear host, dear panelists, dear speakers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christophe Nicodem. I'm the Director General of the European Union Road Federation, ERF, and I'm quite pleased to welcome you all this afternoon for our webinar, Shaping the Future of New Mobility. I will be the moderator along the whole event. I'm delighted to see such a large audience for this event this afternoon. When joining the conference, participants have received practical instructions for the smooth process of the event, so I will kindly remind you to keep your mics off and cameras off during the whole session. You will have the possibility to answer questions to our speakers and panelists uh, during using the question system of the webinar. Our program this afternoon is rather dense and our time is limited, so I will immediately leave the floor to Mr. Dominique Riquet, member of the European Parliament and of the Transport and Tourism Committee, who kindly accepted to host the event this afternoon and he will give us a opening speech. Mr. Riquet, thanks again for your kind invitation and the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Christophe. It's my pleasure to be present today uh, and uh, to host uh, this very interesting uh, meeting. Welcome uh, everyone and thank you for being present to this webinar, despite the difficulties of uh, the special condition of war Working. I want to warmly thank the association we support, which supports our meeting, FNTP, CICA, FIEC, ERF and RDF. I'm happy to see uh, so many actors being present today from the industry and the policy makers too. I believe that this kind of discussion gathering all the relevant actors around the same table is an imperative for effective and current policies. As we know, the topic of new mobility is crucial. The new commissions and uh, its Green Deal have set new ambition goals to become climate neutral by 2050. And any transition shall not be achieved without transport which still represents more than 20, largely yeah, more, more than 20% of EU CO2 emissions and uh, unfortunately on growing trends. In this regard, the whole transport sector faces a double constraint, climate by reducing its pollution and uh, energy too by failing uh, fossil fuel. At the same time, the COVID has reminded us our mobility is indispensable to our lives and our economy. Without transport, there is no such thing as a functional air signal market nor international trade and people's mobility, which harmonizes the EU value of freedom, is directly threatened. The transition, therefore, cannot undermine or reduce our mobility needs. Besides those constraints, EU transport policy is also at the crossroad, interconnected with other areas such as energy, digital, urban, infrastructure, social, financial issues. In this context, more than ever, we need to adopt an holistic approach to make this transition a success story while responding to the mobility needs of our citizens and companies. Before giving the floor to our moderator, I would like to share a couple of words on what new mobility means. To me, it can be understood via two angles, different but still interconnected and very complementary. At first, what is new in our mobility? In the last years, we have seen a period recent technological breakthrough or innovating solutions in our transport and logistics system 
and this trend will be even stronger tomorrow. Certainly, it will be a great part of today's discussion, but already everyone has in mind the core class of digital nowadays, with the rise of connected and autonomous mobility, which impact both the fleet and also the infrastructure, but also alternative fuels such as electrification, hydrogen, or even new mobilities like drones or e-bike and so on. And we have to take care of the new challenge of our traditional mobility. Secondly, taking into account the double energy and climate constraints, new mobility puts the question of what is the mobility of tomorrow, or to phrase it differently, how our traditional mobility can renew itself. Here, I have particularly in mind railway or inland navigation. Even if there are historic modes, let's see, there are the modes of the future too. But the same applies to all modes, including aviation and road, and I'm sure that today's discussions will greatly contribute to this debate. Finally, the world has pro-European MEP and very pro-European MEP in the context of the recovery plan. If there is any good in this crisis, it is that European institutions, as well as some member states, have finally seriously considered the importance of autonomous strategy. Besides being a sole market, protecting our economic interests, the EU is also a place where our sovereignty relies, especially in the current international context, as seeing a deterioration of multilateralism and the rise of competing elites such as USA and China. A certain form of European naivety must end. We need to secure our strategic industries, infrastructure too, and supply chain. As COVID has shown us many European vulnerabilities, we cannot longer let our markets wide open when our trading partner do not assure some level of reciprocity, even and suddenly for the infrastructure too, in terms of accessibility for public procurements, for example. As well, the multi annual framework, financial framework, and the recovery plan must seek to this goal of strengthening our strategic autonomous, autonomous via all its instruments, invest EU recovery and resilience facility, connecting Europe facility, etc., while helping our European company to recover. More than ever, the mobility of tomorrow will be also a sovereignty issue. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I've certainly been too long, but uh, excuse me for that. And I give the floor, I return the floor to uh, uh, our uh, animator. So, Christophe, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Riquet, uh, for this introduction. I think that you really uh, set up the global framework and uh, it would be really good to uh, now develop uh, these different topics into the uh, following parts of uh, this session. So, uh, without waiting, I will now uh, let our next speakers, Amelie Schaeffer from uh, FNTPCA and Simon Janordoli from ERF Group de France, to present you with the results of our international benchmark study, which is really uh, the big opportunity of official presentation of this study to all the audience. Uh, this study, just to remind you, has been carried out by ERF, SICA, FNTP, uh, FIAC and Rue de France for more than one year. So, the presentation will be limited in time and we only give a summary of its content. But uh, I also, uh, I'd like to remind you that the, uh, the full study is freely available on the different websites of the uh, partners organization. So, Amelie and uh, Simon, I just leave the floor to you now. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I, I turned off my mic. Uh, thank you, Christoph, and thank you to Deputy Dominic Ricke for his kind words of introduction. We are very pleased to present to you today with Amelie Schaefer this international benchmark study, which we released at the beginning of September. Um, we will now give a general presentation of it. So our organization, ERF, SICA, FIEC, FNTP, and Route de France uh, initiated this work in, in March 2019. Considering an acceleration in the development of new mobility, we, we wanted to have a global overview of the integration and progress of this new mobility development between 2019 and 2020, just before the COVID-19 crisis. We completed these elements by a long literature review to give this study a more objective dimension. So for, from this overview, it was important for us to know that the place and role of road infrastructure and its equipment in the um, development of the different types of mobility. I think here about auto autonomous and connected mobility, electric and carbon free mobility, urban and active mobility. We asked then the, all the actors of the infrastructure sector in the countries studied, like road administrations, road experts, international organizations, global corporations, um, in order to identify trends and get useful feedback for Europe and abroad. I take here the, the opportunity to once again warmly thank our respondents for, for their contribution to, to our work. I know that some of you are, are, with, are with us today, so. Again, please accept our best thanks. As you can see on the presentation, we, we covered 20 countries in the world and five continents. Uh, we intended to have a balanced representation of each region. So half of the countries are European, the other half are, are the rest of the world. So we, we try to keep a balance uh, in our coverage. What are the main findings then? What can be the main lessons of this work? We first found three key elements. Firstly, a two speed Europe of mobility. As we've seen, the, 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 the north of Europe is more mature integrating new mobility than its neighbors, especially in electric mobility. Or I think here about Norway or the Netherlands. And in connected mobility as well, I'm thinking about the UK for very open regulatory framework. Secondly, we, we see different perspectives between the Western and Asian countries. Um, the Western countries have an old and expensively maintained road network and are moving more towards a strategy based on the digitalization of road equipment. Regarding Asia, it relies on digital mobili mobility technologies as well, but and includes more the physical infrastructure than in the West. That's the example of China, which is directly integrating new connected technologies in its road constructions already. And thirdly, and very innovative Latin America in urban mobility. Um, I think here of the Mexico's BC bike share system that you can see in the background, which is the fifth largest bike sharing system in the world, or also in Santiago de Chile, which has the second, second largest um, fleet of electric buses. I now give the floor to Amelie for the next part of the presentation. Um, okay, so let's uh, head over to um, the four main trends uh, we found within the study. Uh, let's start with the first one, which would be digitalization. And let me pick up some, some examples from, from our study to, to show you. Um, so the digital actors play a key role both in America and in China by addressing the road users directly and proposing more integrated transport offers. So in the US we will have the GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook and Apple, while the Chinese equivalent would be the BATS by Du Alibaba and Tencent. Baidu is particularly involved in technologies for autonomous and connected vehicles by providing, for example, a car software platform to two car manufacturers. And this is, could be seen as an alternative to the software, which would usually be developed by the car manufacturers themselves, but also as a potential substitution to the services offered by Apple and Google. In general, it can be observed that the studied Asian countries want to position themselves as leaders in the digital industry in general. So digitalization will become a key pillar to the deployment of new mobility 
mobility. Um, today, however, new mobility is more likely to be achieved through digital technologies that involve road equipment more than um, the road infrastructure itself. A second point would be governance. Um, so here again, let's head to the United States that gathers the main companies working on new forms of mobility in the world. However, the potential for deployment of these technologies provided by in-house companies is hampered by the lack of harmonizations of regulations in the various states. So each state issues its own rules on the testing of autonomous vehicles. And Canada has kind of the same problem and suffers from a divided jurisdiction between federal agencies and the provinces creating fragmented road infrastructure regulations, despite the fact that Canada actually has one of the strongest state financial support for autonomous vehicle development and testing. And similar governance problems have also been reported by our Chilean respondents. And the problem of governments would be less acute in Asian countries, where new forms of mobility are pushed by a strong political will. The third uh, main issues would be about the, the environment. It is more prevalent in the EU than in the rest of the world, especially when you look at the EU Green Deal and the upcoming sustainable and smart mobility strategy. So the decarbonization of the road sector in Europe will become a key issue for road actors. And we identified that the sector could mainly contribute to the environmental transition through large scale deployment of charging infrastructure for low emission vehicles. Worldwide, the main efforts concerning decarbonization are focusing on traffic congestion, road safety, carbon-free vehicles, and charging infrastructure deployment. The last main trend we identified would be financing of mobility, but also of road infrastructure. And this actually remains subject to major questioning. New funding, moddings, uh, funding models are needed. Um, that favors, for example, user or polluter pay principles to earmark revenues to maintenance, for example, uh, or even the idea of interurban or urban tolls. So I head over to Simon. Thank you, Emily. Let's see now what are the common brands and divergences between the regions studied in this study. Uh, from a global point of view, the Western and Asian countries are quite major in the new mobility developments. China and the US are leading the electric vehicles production, where Europeans are more advanced in active and soft mobility deployments, uh, especially through ambitious urban policy and redefinitions of road and urban space. Even if carbon free mobility often means electric vehicles, most of the studied countries define their energy policies as technologically neutral, I would say, and are, look, and are, are looking still for alternative energies such as hydrogen. Uh, this is, for example, the case, especially in Japan. Um, so if we, uh, Europe, if you look at Europe, uh, it might be caught between a US and China um, competition on standards and norm when we talk about autonomous and, and connected mobility. Uh, besides, when we stay on the Asian continent, we see very ambitious policies in South Korea and in Japan in autonomous vehicle deployment. Um, as already mentioned, the EU remains uh, more ambitious in climate change policies when we look at the whole picture. Um, the main example of this would be the more stringent requirements for vehicle CO2 emissions, which are the highest in the world in Europe. In this sense, the road infrastructure sector uh, must participate and accompany this trend, um, or this downward trend in greenhouse gas emission. Um, when we look at Latin America, it is in a different position, where mainly large cities are innovating in urban electric mobility, Autonomous and connected mobility is not a short-term reality yet. Okay, let us now head to the role of road infrastructure in these developments. Let's, let, let's see how the, 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 world, the, the role of road infrastructure in, is in the development, so it is perceived. Um, on a global scale, road infrastructure is not yet sufficiently considered in new mobility developments. In the meantime, and surprisingly, we find that in all the countries studied, maintenance of road infrastructure is recognized as a key element to, to enable new mobility patterns. Despite this assertion, roads are considered differently in each region. Um, in Western countries, the road networks are aging, as already mentioned. 
if we can take if we can take here the example of the US, um, the quality of the infrastructures has deteriorated so much that uh, two thousand billion dollars major investment program on infrastructures, including roads, tunnels, bridges, has been agreed past year. So here, the safety is the top priority for the US. If we come back in Europe, we have significant differences in expenditure commitments. Where, for example, France and Germany um, spent four or five times less than Austria or Belgium in road infrastructure in the last decade. So here we found that maintenance and adaptation of the existing road infrastructure is essential to, pro to, to provide the development of new mobility. In, in this country, in the West, considering the, the very expensive maintenance of these networks, public authorities are still quite reluctant to establish common world standards and remain quite cautious regarding new mobility developments. Um, when we when we look at, at Asia and uh, studied uh, the, the countries we studied there, we see that China is massively investing in new road and rail infrastructure to better link major cities across the country. For example, more than 8,000 kilometers of motorways were built in 2017. Um, so we have observed that China, given its territory, its demography, and also its development objectives, has a great need for infrastructure. It is not fully equipped yet with road infrastructure and can thus build with the opportunity to integrate aspects that contribute to the development of connected autonomous and carbon-free mobility. In South Korea, a need has been identified to improve transport connectivity and regional integrate, integrity in the Northeast Asian region in order to contribute also to the economic development of the country. In Latin America, improving road condition has been identified as a prerequisite to reach the level of infrastructure connectivity required to support new forms of mobility um, and transport connectivity is also identified as needed to contribute to the economic development and also poverty alleviation um, so let's head over now to our last part about uh, users expectations on the role of road infrastructure so what comes up most among all the studied countries is uh, road safety. Um, but more specifically, in Asia, the expectations include that road infrastructure should support services like vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure communication. And uh, also that the use of traffic data should be enhanced for the benefit of the user. In North America, where the road mode is dominant for land transport, users demand an adaptation adaptable infrastructure to support different modes in urban areas. Um, in Latin America, well, the Latin American example shows us how expectations toward road infrastructure may rise in the future. So our respondents recognize that access to mobility may not necessarily be equal, but specific needs would be better met by allowing flexibility in uses. So the road infrastructure sector might be expected to integrate this demand through the adaptation of existing infrastructure to new mobility need, needs. And let me give you here the quick example of um, how flexibility in uses is put into practice. Um, uh, we, we learned about an app called Where's My Transport, which is deployed in low and middle income uh, cities. Here you have the example on the slide of Mexico City. And you see that um, the informal and formal public transportation network is mapped. So the formal one would be the black one and the informal one would be the orange one. So this as an example. And just to sum it up for all countries studied in Europe, the priorities focus on road safety, limiting congestion and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And and the conclusion, uh, as you know, uh, the study was um, carried on before the COVID-19 crisis and now we have seen some, some developments. So we decided to um, follow up with the study, focus only on European countries and see how uh, COVID-19 impacts mobility behaviors and the place of road infrastructure in recovery policies in Europe, how it, how it will be seen. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amelie and uh, Simon. Very interesting presentation. Uh, although we had to give it in a very limited time, uh, there will be the possibility to ask questions. And again, I say that the, uh, the full study is available uh, on uh, the websites of the different organizations now. I will introduce uh, the first panel uh, of this uh, event, uh, Challenges of New Mobility, New Modes of Regulation and Infrastructure Financing. Our panelist would be Mr. Harold Reuters from Digimove, but apparently you might have some difficulty to join us. He might maybe come a little bit later. Mr. Pierre Anneli from Asker, uh, Miguel Casoflores from Payark, and Mr. Jos van Tomer. Ah, we have Harald. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Reuters. Uh, you just came in time. Uh, for the, the panel, and so the last panelist will be yours, Van Thomas. So I will invite our panelists to now uh, give their presentations. And again, I'm sorry, but because of time limitation, we will need to be very strict in the timing allowed. So no more, absolutely no more than seven minutes. Better if it's six minutes for each presentation. And thank you again. And leave the floor to you for the first panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christophe, uh, for inviting the Commission to take part in this uh, conference uh, here this afternoon in a virtual way. And of course, uh, it is uh, absolutely, uh, I would say, to, to re receive my praise that you continue to do this. Uh, we need to continue to work uh, also in these uh, times which are, are quite uh, disturbing. Uh, I'm very grateful also to Mr. Dominique Riquet. Uh, for hosting it. Uh, we have an excellent uh, working relationship and uh, in fact the year ahead of us is very important and that's why also I wanted to participate uh, with pleasure to this uh, meeting. Uh, as you know uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, launched the Green Deal uh, and uh, has also in her uh, State of the Union on the 16th of September confirmed uh, the importance of it and uh, confirmed also the, the the importance of the uh, the, uh, the climate target plan with 55% of reduction. And uh, in order to, to immediately go to the heart of uh, this uh, panel, which is focusing both on, uh, on new modes of regulation and infrastructure financing, uh, I would like to address first the point of regulation and then the point of, uh, of financing, of course. With regard to regulation, um, we are going to, uh, to propose in December of this year a new sustainable and smart mobility strategy. Uh, Commissioner Valian uh, is expecting to present that in the beginning of December. And building upon that strategy, we will then deploy a number of proposals in 2021. First of all, on uh, aviation and maritime uh, for fuels uh, in both uh, transport modes. And then shortly after, there will be uh, proposals for a TENTI regulation and an alternative fuel infrastructure directive regulation, updates for both of them. And they're closely linked. Uh, in fact, we, we know that uh, we have to, to deliver the Green Deal and in joint combination with, for instance, the CO2 legislation for vehicles and the Renewable Energy uh, Directive uh, from all colleagues uh, in Klima and ENER, we are going to propose the new AFID uh, directive. Uh, what we really need to do is to ensure that there will be sufficient alternative fuel infrastructure for all different alternative fuels that will be necessary for the different transport modes. And they are quite different uh, for, the different, for the segments. If we are on light duty, uh, personal cars and vans and so forth, they are completely different from heavy duty. Uh, we need to take care also of interoperability. Any user, whether it's a, a truck driver or a, a fleet driver, will need to be able to have interoperability, information and easy payment. Now that uh, is going to be rolled out along the TENTI network and the TENTI network, of course, uh, is uh, having a very clear funding coming from the Connecting Europe facility. And uh, the Connecting Europe facility uh, has uh, received the support of Council and of Parliament and uh, Mr. Dominique Riquet is also uh, a rapporteur for finalizing this deal now in, the, in, the, in between Parliament and German presidency uh, in the next months. Uh, it is absolutely key that the CEF can continue to complete the Trans-European Network, the core network by 2030 and the comprehensive by 2050, to have efficient, interconnected, multimodal transport networks. We have seen from incidents in the past that we really need to step up on resilience and on uh, being smart. And your uh, survey that you just presented 
showed also as one of the important uh, trends the digitalization as a first one. But not only the CEF we have, we also can look at the uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility at ELEF and Cohesion Fund at Horizon Europe. And these different budgets together, they will be able, they will allow us to, to, to make sure that we can deliver on the Green Deal. I focus on one point in particular on my next slide, which is the uh, 1 million uh, charging points that are expected to be along the roads. We want to get rid of the uh, eternal discussion chicken and egg, and citizens will want to buy uh, these kind of, uh, for instance, hydrogen and electric fuel vehicles. Uh, companies would like to put in place as of 2025 also electric or hydrogen trucks and we really need to make sure that what is done by the member states is not only at the uh, I would say overall aggregated levels but that in particular we also uh, make sure that there are no gaps in the network that uh, these networks can be used uh, very easily for all and that we do not have any problems uh, with, for instance, open protocols for payment uh, or for information and data on what is uh, available. And of course, if we are going to go to that level of, uh, of uh, use, for instance, of electricity and hydrogen, we also need to think about smart charging. We also need to think about the production of green hydrogen. So it is absolutely key within the Climate Target Plan and the European Green Deal that AFIT may have to become more than a directive, perhaps even a regulation, in order to make sure that there is no doubt that we have a long-term stable framework for delivering on it. And the last slide you will see is the, uh, the the road network, because of course here we are in this road conference. You see here the core network. Uh, we still have a few gaps also that need to be completed from a infrastructure point of view. But as your survey demonstrated, it is not so much about infrastructure anymore in Western Europe. It is more about digitalizing it, about making it sustainable, smart, safe and secure. Thank you. Giving back to, the, uh, to you, Christoph. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harald, for this very interesting, uh, complete information. And you uh, maintain the time limit, which is great. Absolutely great. Thank you. Now we'll uh, give the floor to Pierre Anneli for the second presentation. Pierre, yeah, please don't forget to uh, put on your mic. Pierre, we don't hear you. Yes, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. we do hear you now. Thanks. Yes. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the, the cut. So, um, uh, yes, so I will uh, deal with uh, new mobility and uh, road equipment approval as a product certification body. So, you know, European directives on road infrastructure safety management uh, introduced. introduced Connected and automated vehicles. Uh, it also points out the importance of vulnerable road users and uh, the aging population, and uh, the importance of uh, taking into consideration the visual needs of this aging population. So, the directive also uh, points out uh, the need for general performances for road markings and, and road signs. So uh, road equipment, uh, it's uh, in Europe, it are submitted to mandatory testing and certification. Manufacturers have to make sure that their products are fit for use through third party testing and evaluation. You have accredited testing laboratories uh, which measure their performances. And you also have uh, notified certification bodies which issue certificates with certificates uh, for products described the product type, its related performances, and its monitored manufacturing sites. So generally speaking, road manager must buy, operate, install certified road equipment, which comply with the minimum requirements defined by each member state. 
Next slide, please. So as you can see on this slide, uh, the scope of road equipment is quite broad. Uh, roads and vehicles are the two faces of the same coin. Vehicles need road to be operated properly, whereas roads have to be designed and maintained so that drivers can drive safely. Road equipment are linked between drivers and roads in road infrastructure. On the left, you can see traffic control devices, which uh, are in charge of primary safety. I mean, safety before uh, to prevent the risk of, uh, of cr uh, traffic crashes. So on the on the left, the, the pictures uh, uh, represent, uh, let's say, passive uh, traffic control devices, uh, which deliver fixed information, such as such as traffic signs, road markings. You also have at the center of the of the picture uh, active equipment which deliver variable or adaptive information, such as uh, variable message signs or traffic signals. You also have in uh, road equipment, generally speaking, traffic enforcement devices, so such as speed or red light camera at the center, which are used to detect motoring offenses to the highway code. And on the right, you also have uh, what is called uh, secondary uh, safety uh, traffic uh, devices, which are, are safety devices, uh, which include uh, road racing systems for vehicles and crash cushions. Uh, these uh, devices are for secondary safety, which means to reduce the consequences of uh, traffic crashes when they occur. So what is the, the influence of new mobility of traditional road equipment? Uh, you can see that the development of uh, advanced driver assistance systems underlines the role played by road markings and traffic signs. If the intelligent vehicle uses road markings, road delineation must be sufficient in quantity and quality to be detected, recognized and identified by both the car and the driver. The year-up study, roads that car can read, makes a number of proposals in this direction. It has to be noted that these recommendations look more complementary to than competing with the existing certification requirements on products. New mobility does not eliminate the benefit of road equipment. On the contrary, it supports proper road delineation and signage, while stressing the importance of having a harmonized design, which can be understood by driver and machine vision, and it also supports the necessity to maintain installed equipment. This approach of new mobility also broadens the scope of evaluation from the product itself to the road as a system. It may be as important to evaluate the level of service of road equipment, performances in use for users, as to check the certified product specification of products. So, what we can say is that new mobility and ITS is a uh, fast moving, challenging and, and still uncertain topic for road equipment. ITS purposes may change depending on the area to be considered. Uh, for example, low density rural area and high density urban areas do not have the same public transport offer nor the same traffic space available. Public policies have them to serve and finance very different goals. New mobility could also lead to new specification for road equipment, so different as, for example, road and environmental sensors, connected objects, traffic signals and controllers, or new types of variable message signs. It could also lead to new type of road equipment, such as uh, C2X communication roadside units, Finally, uh, the question of the targeted users for ITS is uh, still open. So many type of users can be, uh, can be targeted. And finally, I would say that new mobility may also shift the, the scope of certification from the product to the whole ITS system. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Pierre, uh, and thank you for respecting uh, the timing. And now I give the floor to uh, Miguel Casaflores from uh, Payac, and I would like to add, because the question was asked, all the presentations will be made available after the event. So don't worry, uh, this will be available for participants. Thank you.
Thank you, Christophe, for the presentation, and thank you to European Road Federation for inviting Pierre and inviting me to this event. I have uh, prepared this presentation as a short gathering of three or four thoughts to bring up the debate around the new mobility and how new mobility can shape the future of road infrastructure. The next one, please. First of all, congratulations to all, to all the authors and the stakeholders of this very interesting and attractive to read report. In the screen, three quotes to which I will refer during my presentation. The first one, new mobility will rely on road infrastructure to operate efficiently. This is crucial and is uh, too often forgotten in the debate of new mobility. The second one, new mobility will ask new competences to road authorities and new partnerships with the private sector. And in a related aspect, road authorities are moving from patrimonial approach to a service-based approach. In PR, we clearly see this in, in this trend in most of our 124 member countries. Rural authorities are moving from being just asset managers to also being service providers, and that changed their relationships with the private sector. Next one, please. This is the first piece of information that I want to share with you today. This is a report completed in 2018 about electric road systems, so facilities to charge electric vehicles while moving on the road. The topic has gained importance among our member countries and we are launching a task force with a mandate of two years. The report is uh, available for free at the link in the screen and the main uh, findings are main risk are high capital cost and immature technology. The road sector is used to high capital cost but we are not so much used to immature technology. Government support is critical. Policy and regulation framework clarity and stability over time is essential particularly if we want to develop electric road systems through public-private partnerships. Funding mechanism will be used up by a principle, but not, not only, because some governments may want to subsidize these systems in order to meet their targets fighting climate change. And break-even can be achieved in as little as 12, 25 years, depending on the system and on the traffic of the road. As a comparison, the last expressways uh, built in under concession mechanism in the northwest of Spain were successfully built for 75 years to achieve the break-even of the concessionaire. The report is extremely complete with a lot of technical, environmental, safety findings, so please read it if you're interested in electric road systems. Next one, please. So, there will be a future, increase of, a future increased use of road networks. The current trends indicate that traffic uh, will increase both for passengers and freight in high-income countries and in low-middle-income countries. Connected and autonomous vehicles will increase efficiency of the road network, but also the use of the road network. And I go back to the previous quote on they rely on road infrastructure to operate efficiently. Autonomous vehicles would increase the road network use because of empty rides. We don't have those today, vehicles uh, running alone, because no parking constraints. In the urban um, area, there's a lot of trips that we don't do with the car because they are not parking affordable solutions. Going to work, going to cinema, you name it. If tomorrow that is no longer a constraint, roads could usefully, road use could you know, rapidly increase, uh, creating congestion. And there will be a decrease of pressure on the travel time. There is no much pressure on how long my autonomous vehicle is spent empty on the traffic to pick me up. And even if I'm inside the autonomous vehicle, this pressure will decrease because I can do other things during the driving. We already have regulations, but we will need new regulations for those autonomous vehicles. We have regulations in Europe about uh, track empty rides and about urban congestions, but they will need to be amended. And this brings us to a big question. The digitalization of the road infrastructure and the vehicles would allow a significant extension of the user-payer principle. Today is already a, a reality in main, uh, in main expressways and national roads. You can see it in Germany, for instance, for the tracks. But in the future, it could be for the whole network. But having the technical possibility to do so doesn't imply that it's the right thing to do. So here comes the big question. How should we finance and fund the future of road infrastructure? Next one, please. Regarding finance, the private sector seems like a key stakeholder for high-income countries and low-middle-income countries, since public budgets do not seem to cope with infrastructure needs in most of our countries. We need to acknowledge that uh, the excellent expressway infrastructure that we have today in Europe 
and I will refer to the three countries that I know better, France, Spain, and Portugal, would have not been achievable without the participation of the private sector. And for the debate, I would like, I suggest to open the possibilities and not link compulsory a PPP with a user pager mechanism. In France and in Portugal, those realities are very much linked, but in Spain, they are dissociated. There are a few expressways operated under toll system, user pay principle, but there are also several financed by asset availability, by shuttle tolls, and by other mechanisms that do not imply user payer principle. Now, in the funding, funding the road sector, it comes down to two options, user payer or taxpayers. And I find the economic and social equity debate around this choice very interesting. And it will contribute to define the kind of roads that we will have in the future, and up to a certain extent, the kind of society that we want to build in the future. User payer principle is a more secure mechanism for funds availability. And in some countries, this is a key issue. Now, if we look into the significant contributions that the road sector does to economic and social development of our countries, we could say that in Europe, most of the infrastructure and services which are essential to the well being and the economy of our societies are highly subsidized. Extreme examples would be the education and the health systems. We don't apply the user payer principle, or not only. And I will finish my presentation with some reflections on today's reality. Road users today pay much more. Sorry, Christoph, if you go back to the, yeah, I finished, but it's in this slide still. So road users pay much more than road that what road cost. In France, for instance, last year, 33 billion euros were collected through fuel taxes, while 13 billion were invested on the road network. And I'm mixing here national uh, government, regional, and even municipalities. In Spain, which is much lower in the fuel taxes, 12 have been collected, eight have been invested. And I think there has been a significant socioeconomic uh, change in the profile of the road users over the last decades. When we put it, um, when we established these fuel taxes a few decades ago, most of the road users were um, wealthy people who could afford to have a car. Today, the bigger road users uh, represent a different social layer. Most of them, they're rural populations, which we do not have um, the trains, the trams, the metro for the daily mobility needs. So on one hand, at least in Europe, we have these rural zones, which are getting empty because of lack of activity. And we have these urban uh, zones, which are accumulating all the services and for which the mobility is highly subsidized and should still be um, highly subsidized. So someone could wonder, should rural, mobility, rural populations still pay more for the mobility while we uh, subsidize the urban ones? And finally, this debate also includes an aspect about direct taxes, where each of us would contribute according to our capabilities and indirect ones, where we all pay the same. I hope there are interesting thoughts for the debate, and this is all from my side. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, we go directly to the, the last uh, panelist of uh, this session uh, with Joost van Thomme. The floor is yours, Joost. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, very good. That's good news to start. Um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, distinguished um, colleagues, uh, Chairman, President, uh, Mr. Reuters, and the other colleagues of the panel. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us at ASEA, the European manufacturers of uh, not only cars, but also vans, bus, trucks, uh, everything on four wheels, I would say. We are based in Brussels, we're doing, um, representing the European industry, and we are very interested in what's happening now on the side of the roads and the suppliers to the roads. Um, this discussion comes very timely, so I think the subject is very good. And also, as Mr. Ike mentioned, also as rapporteur, um, the next year in the Parliament will be key for all of us in terms of infrastructure development and regulatory impulse, I would say. It's a dynamic discussion which we're going through, and I think it's a win-win discussion. And I will tell you why in the couple of slides that will follow. On the next slide, you will see, uh, we talked a lot about um, ITS, CITS, about connectivity, data economy, data sharing, but we haven't talked yet a lot about automation, automated transport. 
Uh, well, there was a, a commission's document in 2018, the, the road to um, automate mobility, automated transport. I think one of the key issues that my members, my OEM see, is that we need to have a good fine tuning of the environment around the cars, around the trucks and the vans and the buses. An automated vehicle becomes an intelligent IoT device, Internet of Things device. It is actually a, something that is able to sense and feel the environment, not only the physical environment, but also the, the digital reality. Um, and it can be weather conditions, it can be road assets, it can be speed limits, reading, etc. But this vehicle, and in the future, automated vehicle, will have to interpret these signals. So to, to have an intelligent decision-making process, somewhat with AI and without AI. That depends in the terms of use case. So our vehicles make decisions based on what they see, what they feel, and what they have learned in the past. It's a kind of deep learning process going forward. And then the vehicle will have to give a signal, a signal on how to react. Will it be a braking system, a steering function? Will it alert the driver? Will it alert all the drivers, like uh, truck platooning, for example, or um, connected vehicles connected to each other? So that ecosystem is new since five to 10 years for us, maximum 10 years, but it's really now hitting the core base of our automotive industry. It's not only about uh, decarbonization for us or about green mobility and clean mobility and safe mobility. It's definitely about smart mobility as well. And there, I think, hand in hand with the road operators, the so road authorities, the concession authorities, but also the suppliers to the roads, I think we can do hand in hand what we need to do. The next slide, you will see then um, what we did in ASEA, a kind of publicity. Please go on our website. We published an automated driving roadmap. How do we see the future and the likely future in the tomorrow, after tomorrow on automated driving? What it is automated driving, what it is not. It is, for example, it's not ADAS, it's not automated, it's not uh, helping functions, assisting function. No, it is the car driving for you. It's the car being driven, uh, you being driven by the car or truck or van or bus. It is a level three and beyond, as we say in the official jargon. This is a document that we discussed lengthy with, with the colleagues of DG Move, the team of Claire and others, but also DG Connect and DG Grow, and especially now with the CCAM partnership um, that is being established now. It's a check of a legislative framework, um, and I come back to that later on. We have a multiplicity of regulatory frameworks on automated driving, quite complex, quite uh, also international driven by the UNEC, working party 29 and 1, and this has to be approximated or being translated in European law international law. So this is something that indeed will be very relevant for the TRAN committee. So an open invitation to Mr. Riquet also to continue our dialogue in this with also the chairwoman uh, equally from France uh, of the TRAN committee. On the next slide, you will then see, um, given the limited time, seven minutes, so um, Christophe tried to do my best, our priorities on how we see this discussion. First, it's not only about pedestrianization, about having cities with less space for vehicles or for, I would say, vehicle mobility. It is about co-modality. And I know it's not a buzzword, it's something my members, my OEMs heavily invest into. It's not only about promoting cars, trucks, vans, and buses, it's about promoting mobility. Mobility becomes a service industry instead of a producing manufacturing industry. So that needs to be in the heart of the future EU transport rules. We have voiced our concerns of the 10T review, which we welcome, of course, but also in the multimodal approach. That's one. Second, we think that urban mobility, for what it is as a European competence, uh, should be more inclusive. It is not only about the, I would say, the, um, the pedestrians, about the, uh, the ride sharing, about the bikes. It's also about vehicles. If you see the COVID-19 situation, unfortunately, in which we are all into, it's thanks to the trucks, thanks to the fire police and so on. They're all drove, driven by cars, by vehicles. So they have their space. Obviously, we know that urban mobility has another uh, big issue. It's on air quality. It's on giving space, uh, also in terms of safety. So we are we're also trying to be inclusive in this. Furthermore, and it's very good to have the roads community here, it takes two, at least two, to tango, even more than two. We want indeed mandatory targets for member states on charging and refueling infrastructure. The AFIT uh, directive that Harold Reuters was referring to is indeed something that is cumbersome. Uh, it talks about national plans, it has to be submitted, 
Uh, it's about redistribution in the member states of percentages. We want a more targeted driven um, and mandatory approach for both sides, by the way, not only for member states. Um, it's deployment for old vehicle types, like Harold was mentioning. Um, electric charging for passenger cars is totally different than for, for commercial vehicles. Hydrogen is a totally different segment as well. That's why, hand in hand with IRU and many other stakeholders, we plead for also good truck parking spaces along the highways, the corridors. There is a delegated act on that under the ITS directive. We definitely want also to profit from that, to leverage it for alternative fuel infrastructure, for obvious reasons. Port, and that has already been mentioned by the Commission, um, it's a coordination, which is gradually being done by DG Climat, DG Envy, Iner, and MOVE um, on the climate change, um, I would say Green Deal, uh, mobility management policies, and there are a lot of them, and air quality policies. We want to have a more consistent approach, like we plead the same for the data strategy. We have the common European data spaces, there is the Data Act, there is the delegated action under the ITS, some of them under review, and there is all kinds of initiative also in DG Grow on access to data. We would like to favor a more inclusive approach with the industry, um, and I think we're making very good process on that. Allowing automated vehicles, it has been mentioned before, um, a lot of regulations there. Um, give you one example, ACSF um, or uh, automated lane keep systems. Most of these regulations are being cocktailed or being negotiated at the UNEC with OICA and with others. And they're now being transposed in European law with DG Grow. And that is indeed one of the targets for us. But it's also, and even predominantly, member states. When I have the L3 pilot project or the truck platooning ensemble project, we have to go for a national type approval um, system. Uh, and it's not with a mutual recognition in other member states. We have testing requirements in Germany, France, that are not I always in But we need to... Yes. Uh, we need I will to wrap up. I will wrap up. Traffic rules the same. Uh, we need some more synchronization. There was good progress. And the last slide, just to mention um, the last slide, just stuff for, yeah, um, it's about physical infrastructure. We have a discussion paper in ASEA with very clear ideas on how we see the road infrastructure, physical and digital, for the future. And we're happy to further discuss this with ERF. And we are in contact with Rick Neutens and amongst many others. So these are just a simple common ideas that from us we would like to foster and really to be take part in the dialogue and again Christophe and uh, Mr. Rike and everybody else thanks for having us and we look forward to the discussion back to you Christophe. Thank you very much Joost and sorry that I had to uh, interrupt you but I wanted to leave some time for, for the discussion um, so we, we heard different points of views from the uh, EC from the vehicle industry from the research part, also from uh, an international association. We heard about regulation specifications, financing, fostering innovation and all these things and we had a lot of information about what is in the pipeline of the EC. Uh, but I would like to have to ask all of you one particular question. Uh, we seem to agree about the necessity of investing into the infrastructure, but if you had to think in a innovative way. What would be your priority uh, with existing or maybe new ways to finance the infrastructure for its necessary adaptation and upgrade? And there is also one question in particular to head out. What are the strategy to embark on hydrogen fuel vehicles instead of petroleum fuel product, uh, products? Yes, uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Christoph, uh, for, for this. Um, one idea is that we really would like to succeed in the rollout of alternative fuel infrastructure, one million charging and refueling points. We would like to do that in a bridged way with blending facility, uh, an alternative fuel facility and uh, thereby ensure that we have both the market side and the public hand working together with all the market parties in the rollout. And we think indeed, as Joost also was stressing, that we should possibly go for a stronger standard-driven uh, approach where we are kicking out the eternal question whether we can deliver in time or not and whether this is accessible all across the network with a minimum level in all countries. 
uh, that will be my big uh, challenge for the coming five years. And uh, I think it will be a major change of, uh, of transport that we are going to see. So uh, with that, uh, I also uh, would like to, 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 uh, to encourage uh, further the discussion of this afternoon and, uh, and unfortunately also need to leave uh, the, the panel here. Yes, Back to you, Christophe. I, I know and thank you. Uh, that's why I asked you the question in priority because I knew that you, you have to leave. So thank you for your participation, Harold. And we will have probably other opportunities to forward some questions to all of you later on. But I come thank back you. to the three other panelists. So what, you, what would be your priority? What do you consider really uh, would be uh, the best way to encourage uh, proper investment uh, in a traditional or a innovative way? Yeah, maybe Christophe, I can speak there. Um, yeah, yeah yours. It's a tricky, difficult question with many angles. Uh, you can have JUs, PPP, CPPPs. Uh, you can have indeed tolling systems, uh, taxation systems, direct and indirect, etc. For us, um, uh, who invests in what is is secondary. For us, it's mostly what is our wish list and how do we see it together in our dialogue paper with the road authorities and road operators. Uh, I give you some examples for automated driving within two three years. Um, ideally, what we would like to see is a digital twinning of the physical assets, the physical infrastructure. Give you an example, speed limits, road signs, um, all these things, besides the lane markings and the usual day-to-day -day work, it is actually, and that can give us a quick win for everybody. In terms of cost, we, we understand that, especially for long stretch, um, if there are roadworks and temporary deviations, that indeed this will recur require quite some investment, I guess, to build up this cloud system. We see similar things with the NAPs, the national access points, that are now going into a federation of the NAPs on the DG Move. That's fine, but we see 27 different NAP approaches. Yeah, For us, our vehicles, they are, per definition, mobile in terms of physical mobility across the borders. So more streamlining, more one cloud system. And I think in the European cloud strategy, uh, this digital twinning of road assets and physical infrastructure would be ideal to do. And we're happy to co-explore avenues for that and share data as well. It's a win-win situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Miguel and Pierre, do you want to add something about uh, the general question? Yes, thank you, Christophe. I don't have a magic bullet. I think the transport is a complex sector with a lot of implications, economical and social. And I think every single solution should be part of the system. But I think these two principles, and I would say a third one, that we may would be a good lead. First of all, I think we need to acknowledge the contribution of the road sector and therefore subsidize it or partially subsidize it. Okay. Secondly, I think it's good that people uh, understand that there's a cost in the use of uh, roads, so they could partially contribute with the user payer principle. Definitely. And the last part that I want to mention, I didn't mention in the in the presentation because it was a seven minutes one. But I think financing the future of the road network is a big challenge. It is not the biggest one. I think the biggest one remains the 23,000 people that are killed every year in the European roads. So when we establish a new uh, financing mode, we have to be careful that there is no bad implications into the road safety. And today we know that putting um, tolls in some of the higher infrastructure, road infrastructure with higher safety qualities, have a bad impact in the rest of, in the in the fatalities. There's a lot of users that use secondary roads to not pay that um, tolls, particularly uh, trucks or lorries, and there's an implication on the road safety. This has been proved in Spain uh, with the A1 and with the A68 for the last two three years. I'm happy to discuss further when we have the time. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you very much, Miguel. Pierre, do you want to add something on the point of view of research, for example? Uh, not, not specifically. I would say that uh, for sure, uh, let's say certification and evaluation and also standards have to uh, have to develop and uh, to evolve in in order to to be able to uh, to catch the new uh, new trends in, into uh, into road equipment and into uh, ITS. 
Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, as you know, uh, our time is very limited. So at, at least we gave you all of you the possibility to to give an answer. There will be other questions that will be dealt with uh, after the event, and if there are some specific ones addressed to a particular person, we will ensure that they uh, they get to the the right person. Thank you for uh, to these first panelists.